time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. My main focus is going to be to the last part of verse 3. A time to break down and a time to build up. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes, Brother Terry, has been contributed or attributed to Solomon. We know that Solomon was the wisest man in the Bible and it begins with him sharing his reasons or his thoughts for viewing life as meaningless full of vanity, that word vanity there means worthless. His thoughts are that despite man's labor, his attainments, what we acquire in this life, our popularity, just the always are our possessions, death awaits all of us. Death awaits all of us at one time. He realizes that there is a time and a season for all things, but does not know how man can fully understand when these times are relevant in our life. A lot of times they just pass us by and we really don't realize how important they are. This confession eventually gives away to the truth that there is no joy for man apart from his creator. Apart from God, there really is no joy in life according to Solomon. Yes, Happiness you. does not come from what we acquire in this life, <coughs> but from what God gives us in this life. Amen. Solomon said that he kept nothing from his eyes. Whatever he desired, whatever he wanted, Brother Johnny, he went out and got it. And he said in the end that it was all full of vanity, Brother Kenny, that it was worthless. And he had everything that anybody could ever want. He had the money and the, and the knowledge to, to do it. Our earthly goes and part from God will not ever bring us true happiness. This is what Solomon wrote to us in a book of Ecclesiastes. In, in a common saying in our in our culture in the day that we that we live in, if it ain't broke, it don't fix it. If it's still working halfway, if it's still functioning a halfway, then we just leave it alone. If it ain't fully broke, don't worry about fixing it. Many people live their lives the same way. Their motto is my life is functioning just fine, so I don't need anything fixed. I don't have any problems right now that needs outside help. But the truth of the matter, what they don't realize, that if it ain't broken and we don't acknowledge that it's broken, that God's not going to fix it. It's going to be a confession that we've got to make on our own. In other words, until you admit that you've got a problem, that you've got a need, there's something going on in your life, you've got to let God know that. Then that's when He'll step in and help you with the problem. Now, I want to talk to you about sin for just a little bit. It's not a popular topic to talk about. There's the categories. There's the lust of the flesh. There's the lust of the eye and the pride of life. Everything will fit into those three categories when we talk about sin. Harvard biologist Edward O. Wilson performed a rather bizarre experiment on ants. After noticing that it took ants a few days to recognize one of their crumpled nest mates as having died, he determined that ants identify death by clues of smell. Not visually, as the ant's body began to decompose, other ants would invariably carry it out to the nest to the refuge pile. After many tries, Wilson narrowed down the precise chemical clue to oleic acid. If the ant smelled oleic acid, they would carry out the corpse, and any other smell they would just totally, totally ignore. Their instinct was so strong that he would dab oleic acid onto living ants. On bits of paper and other ants would carry them, this living ant, they would pick them up and they would carry them out to the refuge pile because they smelled this oleic acid on them. Sure enough, the nest mates would be seized and they would march them out with their legs up in the air and their antennas wriggling in protest, protest out to the ant cemetery because they smelled the smell of death on them. It was an experiment that he'd done. Thus, this positive, the positive the ants, living or dead, clean themselves off before returning to the nest. If they did not remove every trace of the oleic acid, the nest mates would probably seize them again and return them to the ant cemetery. It's pretty amazing. They had to be certifiably alive, judged solely by their smell before being accepted back into the nest. Sin, for us, is like oleic acid. It is the sin of death upon us. We are coated in it, and there's nothing that we can do to get it off of us. 
Our best effort to wash ourselves doesn't get rid of the stench of sin. Our efforts to cover the stench with good works doesn't help either. It's still on us. And it's just a matter of time before you're carried away and dumped in the sin cemetery, which is hell. Now the Bible tells me in Romans 3.23 that all has sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that tells me that all of us have been there. Yeah. Well, Marcus, all of us at one time have been marked by sin. Yeah. That's, how, that's how it is for us. We can do nothing to remove that from ourselves. The stench of death. But Jesus covered us with something that is capable of removing the stench of death yeah. and restoring us to God. And that's His blood. Yeah. It's the blood that flowed at Calvary. It's His blood that was shed for you and me. That, it, that was the blood that He gave for us willingly at the cross of Calvary. Yeah. I found this pretty interesting, Brother Marcus. In the old shepherding communities, all would have understood this image because all knew the problem of the shepherd. He would check his flock in the morning and find a new lamb, but the mother had died during the childbirth. In another portion of his flock, he would find a mother sitting silently beside a lamb that was stillborn during the middle of the night. Now, the mother would die of a broken heart and the orphan would die from the lack of substance. All logic would just tell us, is it not on? Turn it off. Red light sleep, brother. Do it again. Talk. Just keep one touch. Okay, now we're good. Okay, good deal. Logic would tell us. Temperature, all the beautiful and 
exotic animals that God had created and placed there. And they were given dominion over everything. God gave Adam and Eve dominion over everything, Brother Eugene. It was a place of paradise. They had, they had everything going for them. You know, in my imagination, I think it would have been a wonderful place to explore all the beautiful things that were there. All the, all the lions and all the tigers and all the animals. There might even have been dinosaurs there. Can you stop thinking about all these things, Brother Johnny? They could explore all the beautiful plants and all the beautiful things that was, was in this garden. And it was placed there for them. But here's the picture we begin to get as I, as I thought about the enticement of sin. And I've talked about it, I talked about it before. He could have been looking at all those beautiful things. But in Genesis 3, where do we find her? We find her hanging out in front of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Possibly just longing to taste of the fruit of the tree. What happened? Long came the serpent. We all know the story. It's very familiar. You learned it in Sunday school class a long time ago. And he began to cause her to question God. You know, he begins to get us to question God about right or wrong, Brother Marcus. Then he can work his way in to our lives. In Genesis 3, 1 through 7, I'm going to be reading the New Living Translation. It says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course you may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it, and if you do, you're going to die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruits looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. She took some of the fruit and ate it, then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, at that very moment, their eyes were opened up. Suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves up. Now we look at this because of where she was at. My mama always told me, pretty wise woman, as I get older I realize this. <laughs> Never go to any place where you're going to be sorry. Never put yourself in a position to where you're going to be sorry. Never put your place, yourself in a place like that. So this is where Eve finds herself at. She could have been doing a whole lot of other things, but she's sitting there staring at that fruit. And she allowed the serpent to deceive her in her way of thinking, causing her to question whether God's instructions was right, whether it was true. I've always said that Eve was the one to see, but I believe, I believe that when she was offered the that was off of that fruit, anywhere it came from. Sure. He knew what tree that fruit came from. He knew what was going on. And he, he had to go too. He did not hesitate even Sister Marie. Because of sin, human beings are fundamentally broken. Sin has a way of seducing us because it promises satisfaction and fulfillment. Outwardly it looks good and enticing, but outwardly looks can be very deceiving because sin is a trap. No. Sin is a trap. Sin does not and will not satisfy. Oh, it can bring pleasures for a little while, as I've already said. It looks good and it feels good, and that's why it's so powerful and addictive to us. That's why it has a, an allure to it. There's no lasting satisfaction in sin. We're left with an empty and an unclean, ungratified hollow feeling. As I said, Moses said that he would rather suffer the affliction of the righteous to enjoy the pleasures of sin for season. For just a short time. Now this is what sin does to us. Sin enslaves us. Proverbs 5 and 22 says the evil deeds of a wicked man ensnares him in the cords of his sin hold him fast. When a person sins, they are tying themselves up. Instead of a sinner being free and a Christian being in bondage because of our beliefs. That's what, that's what we're told a lot of times. Well, you can't do this and you can't do that so you're under bondage. Really, it's the opposite way around. Sin will not allow them to see that. Every time a person sins, it becomes harder for them to resist 
and easier for them to yield to the temptations of truth. Yeah. Yeah. Just because it's easier and easier the more times that we do it, the more times yeah. that it's done. The finality of sin is that it destroys a person. Romans 6 and 23 tells us for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. James tells us in James 1, 4, 10, and 15, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away with his own lust and enticed. That's when lust hath conceived that bring for sin, and sin where it is finished bring it for death. Yes, you know, I am. Sin in our lives causes us to be broken, which always results in us being separated from God. What is the first thing that Adam and Eve did when they ate of that tree? <laughs> they so feed leaves together. And they feed themselves. Oh God come calling them to cool the day. He said, Adam, where are you? Where are you back? Where, what's going on? He said, you know, we're naked. We we can hit ourselves. It causes us to be separated from God. Right. It's old adage, it's old saying that sin will take you further than you want to go, and it'll keep you longer than you want to stay. It has a hold on you if you will. If we, we, can't, we can't have that reconciliation or that bringing back together with God if we let sin stay in our life. Amen? Amen. Psalm of State discovered the principle during his own life through his own faith. Psalms 34 and 18 says, The Lord is not to them that have a broken heart, and say such as we have a contrite heart. Uh, Psalms 51 and 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, and a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Because of our way of thinking sometimes, we think of a broken heart or a broken spirit, we think of it as being sad. That, that's, that you're down and that's, that you're sad. It's a sad spirit or it's a, a weepy heart. But the true meaning of David's, David's word here is an eager expression using this verse that really means broken. That means violently separated in parts. It means shattered. It means damaged. It means fractured or disrupted. It means to be made weak, subdued, crushed, bankrupt, uh, disconnected, not complete or full. You're totally broken when you're shattered in pieces. Does anybody ever feel like your life is there? That's, that's what sin will do to you. It will cause you to be broken or shattered in your life. They realized two very powerful truths. First, that his heart was broken, not just sad, but that there was something really, really wrong with it, Brother John. Second, that God is attracted to brokenness because the Bible said that he was not or nearer to them, that he will not despise them. There's something about it when you're broken and when you're shattered that attracts God. Yeah. Especially when we allow him into our life. They knew that if it ain't broken, God was not, will not fix it. That's why they did not, he did not mind admitting that he had a real problem in his life. And that's, that's our trouble a lot of times. That we're afraid to admit that we've got a problem. Yes. I'll just speak for myself tonight. We're, I'm afraid sometimes to admit that i got a problem, Sister Connor. And that's, that's what happens a lot of times. We, we think that we can take care of everything on our own, Sister Jessica. Everything's going to be all right. But we've got to admit our problems to God. We've got to let Him know what's going on in our lives. Man. We've got to make Him aware of it. David says in Psalms 32 and 12, I am a forgot as a dead man out of my mind, and I am not a broken vessel. The whole purpose of the Old Testament was to show man that he was broken and that he needed God's help. Romans 7 and 7 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin had been had it not been for the law. For I would have not known what coveting really was if the law had not said you shall not covet. Galatians 3 and 24 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now when you study the, the law of Moses and you study the law of that day, there's many, many illustrations concerning that word brokenness for the body. Uh, an earthen vessel contaminated by an unclean object, either by an animal or a person, was to be broken. 
and discarded and got rid of. When leprosy had broken through the skin, a person was unclean and had to be separated from everyone else. When leprosy had broken out within the walls of the house, the house was to be broken down. It was supposed to be torn down. No sacrifice that was imperfect was allowed to be offered to God. And no man who was broken or blemished was permitted to enter the presence of God as a priest or as a person. That brokenness separated them from God the same way sin does, brother B. Yeah. The whole focal point of my lesson tonight through these illustrations is that humanity has and will continue, brother Terry, to be broken by sin until sin's power is broken in our life. We live under the threat of eternal destruction. Either we make, either we break sin, or sin is going to break us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I'm gonna say that again. Either we break sin, or sin will break us, or it will destroy us. Yeah. yeah. People can be broken by many things. Sometimes other people will break us. Sometimes it's circumstances that break us. Sometimes even God can break us. Right. Yeah. But the majority of the time we have the tendency within ourselves to break ourselves. Our stubborn insistence of doing things our own way is our own worst enemy. The good news is that no matter how we were broken, God <coughs> is willing to fix us up. Yeah. God is willing to repair us. Yeah. If and when we learn to ask Him for His help. Yeah. Amen. He will never force Himself on us, Brother Greg. Right. He wants us to ask for His help. Right. David says in Psalms 147 and 3, He said, He healed the broken in heart and binded up their wounds. Yes, but the jail spoke about this the other, the other morning. Look forward in 18. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised. Yeah. The only thing you and I need to break sometimes is our pride. That's true. Yeah. And admit that we need God's help. Pride, our pride stands in the way a lot of times we must receive the help that we need to God. Uh, so this lesson, and I will say this, needs to be a trip to Brother Raymond Woodward. I borrowed some of this stuff from some of the stuff that he's got on his website. Brother Gio has talked about it, used some of it, but, but he's got a very, very important website. And some of this stuff came from him. But uh, he said, this is what Brother Woodward said about pride. He said, pride is not really that we think too much of ourselves, but the fact that we think too much about ourselves. <laughs> It's the me, 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 me complex. We focus on ourselves. And when we make ourselves, pride has a tendency, brother, to tell you to make us the sinner. It, it's always a, about me. You know how key it is sometimes. You know, they want all the attention. And sometimes that's the way it is in our adult life. But when we make us the sinner, that leaves God out. That doesn't work too well. That doesn't work too, too well. Brother Woodward said, you don't come to an altar to add God to your life. You come to an altar to break down the altars of sin that you have built. And then build an altar to God. You've got to tear down the altars of sin and you've got to build an altar to God. He said, every human being has an altar to something. We all worship something. You can study history, you can study culture, you can go back. Archaeologists have, have, have dug up stuff, but every culture, every race has always had something that they worship. Yeah. And we, we always, we always will. When we apply that principle to our life and come to the realization that I've been broken by sin, and it's going to be through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. Well, the GL preaches about that a lot. But that is the plan of salvation. It is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, and the filling of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. That is the plan of salvation. Yeah. I talked. I talked enough about being broken by sin. Now I want to. I want to look at building, building for life. 
What can we do that has been broken by sin? What can we do to build our life up where God wants it? By making the right decisions. You know, people are ready for a change. And as I said, change always begins. Changing God always begins at repentance, right? It always begins at repentance. Repentance is like that you're totally turning around in a 360. You're headed this way. And you turn around and you go that way, sister. Again, you're totally turned away from what you're doing in life and going towards God. It always begins with repentance. And for us to begin to build our lives, we're always going to have to have God in our life for the most. Amen. Amen. Sure. When I begin to think about a person beginning really to make a change, and I've used this illustration before when I when I, I told the lesson called Life Healing Choices. You know, to, to really begin the process in our life, it's got to be a decision that we kind of make us really in. It's got to be something that we want to do. We get to a place in our life where we just can't take take it anymore. We've got we've got to give give it over to God. And sometimes we we'll mark us our lives on the altar pile. We're we're, we're 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 headed in the direction of destruction. All right. And we're we know within ourselves, Sister Lois, that that's not the way that we want to go. And a lot of times we try to take the reins ourselves and turn it around. And we, we'll do good for a little while, Sister Judy. We'll, 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 we'll straighten up for a little bit. But a lot of times we'll just let go that autopilot keeps back in, which is our mind, and we get it back in the same direction. So for a real change in our life, we've got to include God in our life. We've got to allow Him to begin to have control in our life. I, I think about Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. And I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he brought a work on the wheels. And the vessel he made was marred in the hand of the potters. So he began to make it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Because as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will cause you to hear my words. God's message to Jeremiah in this passage of Scripture is twofold. The first thing he said was, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and he stared, I will cause thee to hear my words. Yes. It's important that you come to church. Yes. Amen. Well, the GM has emphasized that in you. This is where you're going to hear the word of God. Amen. You want to hear the word of God good, I'll tell you. It's the truth. That's right. He told Jeremiah, he said, Jeremiah, you've got to get up and take yourselves to the potter's house. It's up to you to do what I'm telling you to do. Get up, Jeremiah, because that's the place that I'm going to speak to you. That's the place that you're going to hear. My message to the people is going to be at the potter's house. God's reaching for those that have no one else to turn to. To those that have been shattered themselves. Tossed around, tossed about that recent place of desperation in their lives, and they're looking for something better. He doesn't care what your background is, he doesn't care what your skin color is, he doesn't care how much money that you have in your pocket, he doesn't care how much of anything that you have. It does not, it does not matter to him. He does not. It does not matter to him. He'll take all. He said, come ye all to me. All. It doesn't matter. Sometimes we like to place restrictions on people. God said all. Everybody. When I begin to look at this portion of Scripture, there's going to be times in our walk with God that we've got to go to the potter's house, little baby. It's just plain and simple. That's that. And there's also going to be a time in our lives kind of that we're going to have to go through the valley of him. And I'll, I'll explain that to you where, where this was all at. Before we even go up, sometimes we've got to go down. Amen. Amen. Before we go up, 
to the mountain. Sometimes we've got to go down. Right. We learn more in our valley experiences than in our mountaintops. Right. The valley of him was a place of ref refuge. 